You know, for growers, efficiency is a key to their success, and they're always looking at more ways to drive more crop out of the inputs that they use. You know, there's a lot of opportunities between their irrigation, nutrient applications, energy use. Even as an example in energy, currently 27% of our growers are using some form of renewable energy in their operations. We'll also dig into working with different um, utilities and partnerships and finding new ways to be more efficient on the farm. We're here with Julia Village of Capay Farms. Um, they've been a leader in the efficiency space for many years, really before it was a popular thing. Um, Julie, maybe share with us a little bit about the farm itself before we talk about efficiency and just how you guys got started and, and operation. Um, we really started uh, farming about three decades ago, but honestly started farming kind of in an exponential rate about two decades ago. Um, we approximately have 12,000 acres and about 11,000 of that is plantable acres. We have both almonds and walnuts, although we have dabbled a bit with grapes and olives and prunes. And how large a footprint in the valley? I mean, we're here on this property, but you've got properties kind of spread out, right? Yeah, we have properties right now in Glen County, Butte County, and up into Hama County as well. As an industry, we've made really large strides in the area of renewable energy. About 30% of our growers are using some form of um, renewable energy programs on their properties. Maybe, Julie, you can share. You guys were really early adopters in this space. I remember back years ago getting mm -hmm. into solar, getting into natural gas. Maybe you could share some what brought you to the decision that that was the direction to go in and why you've adopted it so widely. So you're right, Tom. Uh, we put on our first system in 2006, and the decision was primarily an economic one, although the payback at that time was seven or eight years. So much of our decision was driven by doing the right thing, kind of exploring renewables and seeing if it was viable in our farms. To date, we have over four megawatts of solar. We have 22 different systems. Payback on many of our systems are only three or four years. In fact, we've got one that was so efficient that it only was a two and a half year payback in terms of a return on investment. And uh, in the last, I guess it was three or four years ago, we did our first battery storage project where we actually are off the grid. So we have a fabulous solar system itself. We've got a battery storage on it. So we're not selling anything back to pg and &E and getting money back from them. It stays all contained. And the payback on that was about three, three and a half years. Excellent. And your solar, you're using it for not just growing almonds, but also processing, right? Yeah, actually we put in almost a megawatt of solar right next to our hauling facility. It only runs, our hauling facility runs six weeks a year, maybe five, six weeks a year, but it's generating energy all year long. So we're able to absolutely eliminate all electrical costs at the hauler and then feed back into our, into our system. We're also using it to feed our new, drying, our new drying facility, which has been fabulous. Again, utilizing some of those efficiencies. And we're currently looking at a model to connect some of the other pumps in the area through the pg and &E NEM program so that we can also use that for our solar. Excellent, excellent. And on the, on the solar side, or just in pumping in general, you've done a number of programs with utilities, correct? Yeah. So, Aside from just doing the solar, it was really important to partner with PG&E, our public utility. And I have to say, PG&E has been very cooperative with us on finding really creative ways for us to get money back from the, the program. They have something called um, their ADR and DR programs, which basically allows us to turn off our pumps either remotely or we can manually do it. It's a demand response program and it allows them to lower the load on their systems by us not pumping. So if they've got an extreme load, they know that's coming up maybe from manufacturing or from any type of any office operations, we're able to lessen the load by shutting off our pumps here. By doing that and being involved with them, we use a third party um, kind of vendor that's an inter intermediary that helps us monitor that and make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also working with them closely on peak day pricing, so we know when to run our systems, um, how long we should run our systems. I think my irrigation manager is going to talk a little bit about that as well. 
Um, and currently we're working with them on several other um, programs that allow them to build infrastructure. I believe one of my other managers is going to talk to you about it, but they paid for all of our smart meters to be installed. And by having those smart meters installed, we were, get, we were able to be involved with some of these other programs where we can automatically turn off our pumps. And what a great thing to be a steward of this power grid locally. I mean, that really helps the grid for every, all the neighbors as far as agreeing to shut down with PG&E. That's a great program. Yeah, and actually it's been really fun kind of sharing what we've learned with our, the other neighboring farmers. A lot of them are, you know, so busy doing everyday work that they forget to kind of look out of the weeds and see what's going on. So I've been able to share a lot of the things that we've been doing with our other local farmers. And so you're seeing it throughout the valley now. Excellent. So Julia, you've been a trendsetter really in, in just efficiencies in general. Um, you've always been a leader in that area. What's next? I mean, you've, you've done efficiencies with water, you've done efficiencies with power. I'm sure you're looking for other things. What, what's next? Well, we are in alignment with a lot of what the Almond Board is trying to do. Um, we are very keen on reducing our waste. We're looking at different recycling programs with the Almond Board right now. And we're actually currently investigating a biochar facility that will allow us to take much of our biomass, whether that's from our pruning or orchard removal or waste from our huller, and put it into a facility that's able to produce a biochar byproduct, a syngas byproduct, a wood vinegar byproduct, and will reduce carbon emissions. So those are all things that are really exciting. We're doing a ton of research on it right now. Excellent. So those are a lot of different projects. It's got to take a lot of work. How do you, how do you manage this as a company? That is a great question, Tom, and one that I've been wrestling with for a long time. Fortunately, my sister has recently come out of a graduate school program and she was very keen on actual sustainability. She actually got her master's in marine biology, was, had done a bunch of research on water conservation, land conservation, obviously ocean conservation. So it was a natural fit for her to come on board. She's been in charge of leading um, all of our research on the biochar facilities, helping me with additional solar systems that we're putting in. I've got her 100% in charge with our new relationship with Polaris and our ADR program. And she's also working very closely with Matt and my farm management team on our aerial imaging as well. I also do consider our entire ranch team our family. So there's your biological family, there's your ranch family and they really are our family too. You, you bring up a really interesting point. I don't think people realize that a farming operation is a huge massive family and you've had employees for years and years that have been, they're just part of the team. They are. I think that's really important to highlight that. Yeah, we couldn't do anything without them. We're here with Ben Walsh and Matt Cox of Capay Farms. Maybe you guys can share what your role is in the farm, what each of you specialize in. Well, I'm Ben and I work with our special projects team. Um, I run our walnut huller during harvest and then our special projects include things like our radio frequency network and some of the data collection we have from the sensors out in the field. Yeah, Matt? Yeah, Matthew Cox, uh, irrigation manager. So I work primarily in things where uh, regarding the pumps, the irrigation design, and irrigation scheduling. Excellent. So Matt, you were saying you're responsible for irrigation. Irrigation is a big topic. It really starts long before you put any pipe in the ground. Can you share the process of determining how to design the irrigation and, and then the steps, how you follow through to make sure you have efficient irrigation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, from the very beginning, um, in our newer orchards, we're using some of the latest technology to map the field and get a lot more accurate maps of the different soil textures um, in a given property. Uh, those maps are geo-referenced so that we can go back to those exact same points at any time in the future. These maps, are they aerial images, satellite images? How are the maps created? We actually have um, partnered with a, a little vendor here in the area and they come out with basically a sled and drive up and down uh, in a grid pattern to get a physical map of the ranch. So he's getting GPS points, taking measurements of the, the soil texture. And then from there, that allows us to go out and dig backhoe pits to get um, a three-dimensional 
idea of the different layering and the different textures of, of the orchard that we're about to plant. So you're literally digging down and doing a physical check where you can actually see the soil and see its structure yes. at the different depths. You're not just trusting necessarily the skid, you're verifying it then. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The, the, the going out there and ground truthing, we think that is vital. Um, in doing so, it allows us to see different um, layering of minerals that maybe move in, a, in the soil or get built up when there's an impenetrable layer. Mm -hmm. And then also we can get different measurements of the water holding capacity at the different layers. So that helps us in the future understand the potential water holding capacity that each tree is gonna have in the future. So in the past, when we designed the irrigation system, we used to take, say, 100 acres, break it into four blocks, 25 acres each, and design the system. And we didn't really factor the soil. So are you using the soils data to help you design and, and decide how that irrigation is set up? Yeah, absolutely. The, the newer systems may be a little bit more of an upfront cost and putting a little bit more pipe in the ground. But with that upfront cost, we're able to irrigate to each of the different soil types and realize the cost savings in the energy uh, that's required to pump the water over the lifetime of the orchard. So you, you design the system and then you install it. So you, you, you're installing the match and take into consideration these variations. So you're, you're really delivering water to the need of that group of trees. Then. Absolutely. And, and what do you do to verify the effectiveness of that? Do you have a way to really tell that you're meeting on that goal? Again, back to those maps, uh, those help us place uh, soil moisture probes uh, that allow us to measure the water penetration and water um, amount of water being held in the soil at different layers down to a five foot depth. Oh, so you're measuring multiple locations down to essentially the root zone then? Absolutely. That's, that's how we really you know, are able to monitor the water, you know, and how far it's going into the soil and how much of, of a reserve we have for later in the growing season. Yeah, so is that where you come into this conversation, Ben? It, getting this data out of the field? So these, these sensors that you're putting in the ground, they produce data. So is that where your role with the RF network comes in, collecting that data? That's exactly it. The uh, soil moisture probes and all the sensors that we have out there, whether it's the switches monitoring the water flow or, or the soil moisture probes monitoring the moisture in the ground, that is all relayed back through a radio frequency network that we are collecting at individual ranches at the pump sites as well, and then relaying back to our main office and collected into a large pool of data that we then get to interact with. So they come back to the pump sites. Uh, Julia was talking about the auto demand response program where you can control and turn the pumps on and off. I'm guessing that's part of this network. Do you collect data at the pumps as well? Yeah, the pump sites uh, with the stable source of power that's available at them uh, is a great place for a radio master unit that we can communicate with the probes in the field as well as all the information available at the pump itself. Uh, flow meters, well levels, uh, oh. pressure switches, uh, all monitoring the performance of the well and uh, our watering in the field. So measuring the well, that must really help during a dry year like this. I mean, can you speak to that? Yeah, at the pump sites, we have sensors that are able to help us track the well levels. And in both wet and dry years, that's helping us uh, review the longevity of a well, the recharge of, the, of where we are pumping the water from, um, helping us monitor and track all of the performance of, of both the earth and, and the pump stations themselves. And, and with all this equipment in the field, are there the other things that you measure? Um, do you tie your solar systems into it? At those pump stations, good place for most of our solar arrays. Uh, we are able to track the performance of our solar arrays as well as um, relay all of that information back to the office and be able to manage whether uh, solar arrays need cleaning or yeah. how well we're producing energy over the course of the entire year. And just having the numbers and the measurement, it's got to really help make decisions, right? You're not shooting in the dark. You actually have something to go on, right? The RF network allows us to capture a lot of data out there. Um, and then the way we have begun merging it in the office, we can collect it and put it in the same pool with data that's collected uh, from the employees and, and other managers. And it really allows us the ability to pick and pull at which por portions of the data we want to compare and contrast and review over the course of a year or multiple years. 
and this network, did you guys develop this yourself? Did you work with, with a vendor on it? I mean, this is a big undertaking. You're, it sounds like you're using it for a lot of different things. How'd you come to, to the point of building it out, and, and how, do you, how do you go through that step? Our, our version 1.0 of the radio network, uh, we were guided by multiple vendors who helped us learn some about uh, both the radio technology as, the, as well as the ability to tie in sensors with most of our uh, pumping sites and the solar arrays. Um, but on version two, we're kind of looking at broader blaze platforms that are not necessarily driven by a particular vendor or technology or sensor, but uh, a little bit broader based uh, platforms that allow us to collect from multiple vendors or multiple different uh, vent, uh, sensors and put them all in the same pot. And I, I would imagine, I just think of the time you spend in a truck driving around, having sensor data must, at the, at the ready, right, must really save you a lot of effort of driving around, fuel costs of driving around, and just labor. I, because you guys spend a lot of time in vehicles, right? I don't think that... Match the, going, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ab absolutely. You know, yeah. yeah. At first, it takes a little bit of time to get used to viewing all that remotely and building some faith in the new technology, but really being able to monitor what's happening at all your different pumping locations, what all your different irrigators are doing at any given time, it, it's really just a time savings device for, for the entire management team. So it lets you focus. I, I mean, back in the day, you would have to drive to Arbuckle from here to see what was going on. But with this network now, you don't have to make that trip necessarily. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even with cell phones, who knows if you're going to get cell phone reception. Yeah. So really being able to get that all in your handheld device or be able to record it back at the office has, has been real, it's really good time savers. savers. Yeah. Yes. So working with staff, embracing a new technology can be a challenge, right? and bringing everybody on board, and you've got different levels of expertise. What's it like working, especially with the field staff, that you've got a lot of staff aren't really super technical, right? And you've got this new technical thing. What's it like getting staff to embrace it and, and work with it? Has that been a challenge? Did you go through a lot of process yeah. to get there? Technology, laughing it's, technology yeah, is right. scary, especially in a, in a farming atmosphere where maybe technology hasn't really, you know, got rooted just yet, but I think everyone's seen that it's not necessarily there to replace them or to catch them. It's not meant to be big brother. It's really a tool that we can all use to make all of us more efficient and also make all of us as employees more valuable to the company. And that's the thing that you guys are really, it's neat that you have this family atmosphere within the team. It's really about improving for everybody, right? It's a benefit to every employee that you improve your efficiency, and, and your team seems to be pretty on page with that, on yeah. board with that. I mean. Yeah, and the Village family have definitely been generous, uh, both in their investment in technology, and then also passing along, you know, some of those savings here to the employees to, to really incentivize right. us. The uh, platform that we're using is also allowing us to share data with uh, the, the field staff and, and employees out there that may not have had a chance to see it before, but now it's in a, an interface that we can bring the data back to them and get their input on the data as right. well. So it's, it's making it a much more uh, user-friendly all the way through all the layers of the management staff and, and uh, to the field employees. And I'm guessing as a team, that's got to be a powerful tool. If you're managing this parcel, the managers for, from other parcels get to have insight into this and can share back and forth ideas that work for them in their, their areas compared to here. Yeah, it, it really is a type of view into the, the workings of the field that we've never had yeah. before this. Yeah, excellent. So Matt, there's a lot of moving parts in a farming operation. You really focus on efficiencies across the farm. And I know you're looking at, at a pretty new approach to dealing with renewable power and renewable energy. Share with us, you know, what is that? I mean, I hadn't heard about it before and I think it's pretty novel. Now, Tom, you know, I think, you know, I'm obviously I'm, I'm a smaller grower and, and in order for us to be competitive uh, and stay in this market, uh, we see, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because I, you know, obviously own a pump company. And because of that, I, I see a lot of manufacturers come across 
And again, you know, this, this farm acts as a lab. It acts as a lab for us, but it acts as a, a lab for them as well. And that's really important. So a lot of times we get new concepts. And one of the things that, that, that has evolved out of Europe is a, a variable speed, uh, variable frequency drive. Uh, that drive allows you... So that, just to explain, a variable frequency drive helps balance the load going out to the field so the grower, you're using the electricity, you're consuming not the pump rating, right? Right. Okay. So what, what happens in this, this in, in, in I, and I just stated as far as, um, as a small grower, I've got small blocks and we've got a 40 that we're trying this out on. Part of it's French Columbard, front, part of it's Cabernet, and part of it's almonds. So it's divided in uh, proportionally into thirds. A lot of times a pump will, will just pump enough water or have the water for all 40 acres, but each crop has its own requirement. So we know that as a small grower, that that this variable frequency drive will fit for us because there'll be a, a spot, the pump does 400 gallons, there'll be a spot in the French that we only need to irrigate at 150 gallons, whereas in the almonds at a different time, it might be 250. So it lets you dial in to the need rather than just sending 400 gallons out. That's right, yeah, right. yeah. And, and wasting energy. So we've, we've got that, but what makes this particular VFD or this drive uh, per particularly interesting is that it allows us to take solar during the day and use it off grid, right? And then at night with the flip of a switch, I can go back on grid. And I think that's gonna work really well for us because a lot of times getting these solar projects approved uh, and, and, and brought through the process, it's just PG&E just doesn't want to, um, to, to take on a whole bunch of smaller projects. So what we see is this is a really that, good they're fit. They're your, your local utility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that it's, thank you, Tom. Yeah. yeah, it's our local power company. But what, they, what they're wanting is that they, they like the idea of the fact that we're off of, their, off of their grid during the day, which is when everybody's consuming energy, and then at night we can come back on. And it fits in that third, third uh, spot. So I think it's going to be a really good technology for small growers. So Matt, anybody that knows you knows that you have these four M's that you focus on. Speak to what these four M's are and, and how do you come up with these and, and what are they? Well, Tom, I mean, we, we just talked about, you know, systems approach, balance. Uh, those things are super crystal, critical for us. Um, and for me, I have to have a process. You know, I, I like random thinking, but uh, I don't like random processes. So the 4M became really, really critical. And, and how you start is you map. And that was really important to the Soil Conservation Service and the United States government because most of the land is mapped in the United States and basically the soil is our bank. So mapping for me became like the, the most logical so that I could understand in each one of these blocks, uh, the soil types, uh, how, the, how the crop performed, what I should plant, uh, and then and then where's my, you know, where's my root structure? What we see above ground, there's, there's double that underneath the soil. So really important to understand the mapping. The next part of it, what we did was you, you've got to be able to measure, right? And if you can't measure, you can't manage. And we've heard that a thousand times in, in different venues, but it is absolutely critical to be able to, once you know where you're at, to start measuring. And it's important to, to measure, but, but what we did when we started out was we were, we were using a hand auger to go out and we'd take samples or so check. So you would bore down in the ground and pull some soil with the hand auger. We would. And you know, in, 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 you know, in the middle of summer, it was really difficult. There'd be five blocks that my dad would want to see weekly. Uh, so that meant that I had to take a five foot auger and dig down in the ground. And what happened to me was, is that I was fairly accurate with it, but it was one reading a week. I would, I would venture to bet that most people, if you're augering and you're digging five foot cores or five, five foot holes, most people, that's not something that anybody wants to do. It's a lot of work. Yeah. 
So what we did was we said, let's, let's use a device that'll allow us to uh, look down in the ground. And so we went to Australia and found a, a capacitance probe, but it's a full profile probe. So it's a, a set of sensors in the, that you're putting into the ground. Absolutely, yeah. Tom. So, and they're one foot apart. So what that allowed us to do is put those sensors down in the ground in a, in a spot that we knew that we'd mapped, whether that be soil or loam. Uh, and then we controlled how much we irrigated in that block. What was interesting is that once we did that in our crops, we used to have these ebb and flows. So we'd have a big year, like we'd go into 10, 12 tons of grapes and we'd come out of it and we'd do seven. We'd, we'd do 11 tons and maybe the next year we'd do eight. Once we started getting that read on exactly how much soil moisture we were using and, and, and how that looked, we actually could set those, those sensors in the ground get 99 readings a day and when we saw that we could see when the crop was you know how the water was moving through the soil and how the crop was taking it out once we did that we put a high mark a benchmark and then a low benchmark and all we had to do is drive between the lines once we did that we were able to actually recreate success year in year out uh, with our crop so instead of getting a seven seven, seven ton crop we consistently got between 12 to, to 15 tons year in, year out. That was a game changer for us. So continuous measurement, continuous improvement is critical for us. So and then, now that lets you in the almonds, you're managing just to what the tree needs. It's, it's letting you know when you can stop irrigating and when you need to get back onto irrigating. Absolutely, yeah. and in what soil type. That was that map part, Tom. So it was really, really important. And like you just said, once we knew, we knew how to manage. So right. that's the, those are the four principles, map, measure, monitor, and manage. But sustainability, it is critical end to end to farm at 100%. And it's really important for me, and it was really important for my dad for this, this ranch to be sustainable. Uh, he had it in mind that, you know, that he, you know, he died when, or passed away when, when Michael was uh, 10. But it was something that he absolutely wanted him to continue. And so we, we, uh, we're honoring that. We think that that's really, really important that, uh, and, and Michael, my son, has a love for this land and, uh, and what we do. And I think it's gonna be really important. I know that he'll pass that same value down, but when, you, when you're in balance, like we are here, and you can see behind us, this is an amazing environment. You know, we're, it's, it's incredible. I think that's just natural, you know, for the next generation. So what other things do we need to do? Well, Tom, we've covered a lot of things today, but yes, I think- we have. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I think that, that, you know, with that is that I think that, you know, as we are, you know, high efficiency resource operators, the critical link for us, and, and it's always start with the end in mind, right? So marketing is critical, because now you, you have to ask, what's the market want? And that's essentially why we started growing almonds because as the almond board, you guys have done an amazing job uh, talking about, you know, this nutrient rich protein source that just is incredible for people. And I think globally, I think people love almonds. So um, the marketing side for me is, is kind of the critical. And I think in, in our family, um, we, we'd like to be able to, to start producing you know, our own label, uh, just like, like people do with their wines. I think that that's gonna be fun for us so that, that we can label where it came from, who grew it, how it was grown, and the care and, and the passion that went behind it. Thanks for joining us in the orchard. We hope you enjoyed learning more about our growers' use of technology to improve on-farm efficiency. Join us next for a wrap up of our first day with Gabrielle Ludwig, Director of Sustainability and Environmental Affairs at the Almond Board of California. Throughout these in-orchard sessions, don't forget to submit your questions for the live Q&A on Wednesday.